-hmm. Right. It's um... what I will say is that I'm more than happy to take questions at any point. Okay. Um, but I don't know if that's best managed via the chat. And if you want to just flag if there's a question and let me know what the question is. Okay. Is that all right with you? Yeah, that should be fine. I'll manage the chat box and we'll let you know if there are questions from students here. OK, OK. And um, if I go too fast, tell me to slow down. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> OK, I so, guess we um, start now. Um, yeah, sure. Yeah, uh, let me start um, to give an overview of uh, Dr. Nina to our students here from Malaysia. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and a big thank you to Dr. Nina for willing to share with us her uh, knowledge, yeah, specifically on research methods today. So before we start, uh, let me give you a brief overview of Dr. Nina. Uh, she's a professor of marketing in the Faculty of Business and Law at the University of Wollongong, Australia. She has a PhD in international marketing research and her master's in questionnaire design. And she has two bachelor's degrees with honors, one in American management studies and one in psychology. Uh, Dr. Nina is actively involved in research and her interest in, is in consumers' behavior. She's also an expert in research methods and her current focus is on digital research. So we'd like to welcome you, Dr. Nina, to share knowledge with us today. I'll pass to you, Dr. Nina. OK, thank you. Thank you. So um, so on a more personal note, I have a puppy. Um, I've just been on holiday in the UK, catching up with family post COVID, oh, all right. and, uh, <laughs> which was pretty good. But I'm still trying to get back into the swing of, yeah, swing of yeah. work again. I hope we've had so, a good break. <laughs> yeah. So there were three things that I was asked to look at today. Let's see if I can get this moving. Um, the problem statement and what that was, the literature review and writing up. So I'm going to briefly go through the problem statement and there is a, an extra resource on the slides which I won't play because I suspect it will go horribly wrong over the Teams meeting. Um, so briefly look at what it, I think a problem statement should do. Then I'll look at the literature review and that kind of thing and then consider the, the factors that I as a marker look for when I'm writing up and I might tell you a few stories there about things that have gone wrong or things that have gone right. So you'll see this slide a few times just to keep us on track. So the problem statement. The problem statement is a way of telling your reader what it is that you're talking about. So it is the what, where, who, when and why or how. You're looking at saying, what is that factor that you're looking at? So, for example, if you're if you notice a behavior in a shop and you think, why do people respond in a particular way to buy one, get one free offers? You might say, well, that's the what, where it happens. It's generally in a supermarket session and um, shopping. Uh, it often might be to do with fast moving consumer goods. So that's a bit of what, who it is. Well, we're looking at the consumer and the household consumption patterns. When? Well, it's during an event. And the why and the how is kind of like, well, what is it that people respond to? How are they processing the information? So you're trying to give a real clear picture of the thing you are investigating. And part of that will be deciding what is included and what is excluded. So if we extend the example of the buy one, get one free, you might say I'm only looking at this in terms of toiletry items. So I'm not going to include um, food items. I'm only looking at shampoos, soaps, all that kind of stuff. Or you might say, you might say I'm only looking at this in the context of a supermarket, not in the context of anything else. So you kind of got to say what your problem statement is. And a key part of the problem statement is saying why it matters. So why it matters is all connected in with your audience. So it's sometimes referred to as the so what question. Another way of thinking about it is why should anybody care? So you're really looking at that idea of this is a problem I want to understand better or help to solve. 
how do I move forward from that? Now, I've put level in there because when you're looking at your problem statement, one of the things you need to establish is what it is you're looking at, the what or the who. Now, you might be looking at an individual. So in marketing, you're often looking at consumers. So you're saying that is an individual I'm concerned about. In management, you might be looking at an organization. So that is this particular kind of group. But in other things you might be looking at, so finance, you'll sometimes look at an event. So you need to be understanding when you state, do your problem statement, what level you're considering, because this becomes important when you look at some of the theories you might use, because if you're looking at an individual and you use theories that are related to groups, then you've got to be able to say why it relates to that individual. So you're really trying to clarify the problem you're looking at, why that problem is important and who it is important to. So I'm not, I've got a video link in the slides and I'm sure those slides can be shared. So just have a look at, it's another way of processing the information and seeing how it goes. Okay, so that's the problem statement the statement of what everything, what it is you're doing research on, why it's important and why it's important to do it now. The next thing you need to look at is the literature review. Now, the literature review is essentially what we already know. It is, it, so it helps you identify the knowledge that exists but also you should be reading it and looking at it as a way of identifying where knowledge is lacking. So your research gap or your research opportunity. Now, you're always, and certainly when you're writing up, and we'll get to this a bit in the writing up section, the way your dissertation, your thesis is presented, it's presented in a linear way. So it's presented as introduction, literature review, methods, etc, etc. But when you're doing this, whilst you will do a lot of your literature review prior to collecting any data, in, in fact most of it, you don't finalise your literature review at that point. So you still need a bit more work. Now, one of the things that's important when you're doing your literature review is you're considering where and how the way knowledge has been accessed impacts on what is actually known. So I'm sure you already know that if you're collecting data via qualitative methods, you get a different type of data than if you're collecting it via quantitative methods. So what you can know about something is different according to how you access information. So I'll unpack that a bit in a second but that you've really got to pay attention to that because it also is applicable to the context in which you're looking at things so if you look at things in the consumer context you will find out different things about individuals than if you're looking at those same individuals in a work context so that can affect how those individuals behave and the theories might you might use and the motivations and all that kind of stuff so two things you remember about the literature review the first is it's presenting what is already known so it's not about your results or your discussion or your conclusions but later on we'll talk about how your literature review sets up what you can discuss it's a jigsaw puzzle your literature review you're trying to show someone the whole picture i don't know whether you can see my hand gestures but i always use hand gestures when i talk um, and that jigsaw puzzle the individual papers are the puzzle pieces but what you want to present to the reader is the whole picture, not just each individual piece. And what this means is that you don't write reports on individual papers, you discuss ideas. So if we look at something, a theory that's used in marketing is um, the theory of reasoned action, which came became the theory of planned behavior. So you don't talk about how author one says this, author two says this, author three says this. You say, when looking at the theory of reasoned action, we have three different areas um, that feed into uh, 
attitude that lead to behaviour. One area is social norms. Social norms have been discussed by various different people. These things are said, blah, de blah. Then you go on to the next idea that you're discussing. So when you're looking at it, the, you, you read individual papers, but what you try and do is you try and discuss the ideas across papers. So one of the most frustrating things as a marker you find is that students have had done a really good job of understanding individual papers, but they're not presenting you with the ideas from those papers. They're just giving it effectively an annotated bibliography, which is not a literature review because you're not critically evaluating the material in a way that is helpful for setting up your project. So I'm hoping that makes sense to you all. So I said I'd come back to considering how knowledge was accessed and how that impacts on what is actually known. So when you're looking at that, you can any project you are doing. Is separated into three different areas. You have abstract ideas or the abstraction of reality, theories and concepts. So the theory of reasoned action, the theory of planned behaviour, they have abstracted reality to say when you look at how people make decisions, they take into account social norms, individual attitudes and perceive their, the behavioural control. And then they look at that and that's their abstract idea. Satisfaction is an abstract concept. So all those things are your abstract ideas. You have a concrete reality in which you are studying those abstract ideas. So you have to do with the organisation. So you might have organisation, which is the concrete reality of a thing. And how what your choice of concrete reality might impact on the things you find. So, for example, if I was doing a study on the weather, this is an example I use all the time. What you might say is you might say, well, I'm interested in the extent to which weather is consistent across different places. And I found two studies in my literature review, one of which says the weather is generally consistent everywhere. And another of which says the weather is different depending on where you are. Both of them have used really sound methods. There's nothing wrong with the way either study was done, yet they've come to completely different conclusions. And part of your literature review, when you're looking at these things, when you're being critical, would be to say, well, how do I unpack why they're finding totally different findings? Now, totally different findings might be found because one of those studies that found the weather was the same and it didn't matter really where you are, was studying weather in Wollongong, Sydney and Newcastle, which is just north of Sydney. Whereas another one which find, found that the weather was different depending on where you were, might have been collecting data from Penang, Sydney and uh, let's say Sao Paulo in Brazil. So it's not that either study had different abstract ideas that they were applying. Their ways of accessing knowledge, the way they measured the weather, the way they recorded data could have been exactly the same. But what differed and why they found different findings was because their concrete reality, the sites that they chose to study the weather, differed. So by unpacking and looking at the detail of the papers, you can start to say, why things might be finding different findings. So a lot of research methods doesn't look at those abstract ideas or those concrete realities, but looks at the ways of accessing knowledge, the methodologies and methods. Some of my favourite words, ontology, epistemology, all those kinds of things. So what we can know and what we believe about reality also impacts on how we interpret and use data and what we believe that data can do. So when you're writing your literature review and you're looking at papers and you're trying to understand what the paper is telling you, part of what you need to do is you need to understand the perspective of the paper. 
So if someone has a constructivist perspective or an interpretivist perspective, they're going to have a different view of what they need to report and how you would understand things and how they interpret abstract ideas and what is going on in the context than if someone has a very quantitative or positivistic approach to research where they're going to be reporting generalities and numbers. So I'm hoping that kind of makes sense. So we go back to the previous slide. Part of your, when you're looking at your individual papers, the individual jigsaw puzzle pieces, you will be trying to unpack the way knowledge has been accessed, the abstract ideas that have been used, but also the concrete reality that has been studied. And when you're looking at trying to put the ideas together, it might be you say, well, when people look at, I'm going to continue with examples of use social norms, and um, the abstract, when they look at social norms from the perspective of a more interpretivist philosophy, they will concentrate on certain things. When they're looking at social norms from a more positivistic or reductionist philosophy, then they will look at other things. So when you're discussing the ideas about what social norms are, you will have these different perspectives to weave into each other. Now, I will share some papers with uh, your lecturer um, so that if you need that extra information or you want that extra information, then you can read up a bit about it. So what's next? So that's kind of the literature review. Whilst you can, we have whole courses on literature reviews here, but we're not going into that level of detail because we just don't have the time. Um, so the next thing I'm going to look at is writing up and what you need to consider or what I as a marker want you to be considering when you're writing up. So what I look for in a written up dissertation. So I'm going to divide this into three areas. One is housekeeping. Second is coherence and consistency. And the third is clarity and conciseness. So I'll start with the simplest and most straightforward one. When you are marking something, first impressions matter. So you need to be very, you need to take care of the basics. And what I mean by that is that you need to make sure your spelling and grammar are good. You want correct and complete referencing and you want consistent formatting. Now, these things sound logical, but what you find is as a marker, if I see poor spelling, incomplete referencing, font changes, I start looking and thinking, well, if they're sloppy with these basic things, what's their work? Are they sloppy with their work? So it makes me think as a marker, or it makes me suspicious as a marker as to the extent to which you've been thorough with other things and you don't want the marker to think you've not been thorough with your work. Another thing is things like orphan headings and what I mean by orphan headings is the headings at the bottom of the page with no text underneath. These are all very very simple things they're just about but this is why I call them housekeeping. It's like tidying up before a guest arrives. You're tidying up the document so that when, you're, when your marker looks at it, when it's read, they don't look at these things and think this is a messy document. Correct table and figure numbers. So if you're referring to a table in your text, it is the correct number of the table that is presented to you. And then look at things like the sections, the paragraph and the sentences. So what I mean by that is sections, you need sections, you need subheadings because that guides the reader through the document. So you should think about how your sections connect to each other. Now, a general rule of thumb is if you're having subsections, you shouldn't have using headings, you shouldn't go from 1.1 to 1.1.1 .1 .1 to 1.2, you should have at least two subheadings within any major heading to break things up. 
not sure how clear that was, but it's uh, so it's like if I if I'm looking at the theory of planned behavior again, I might look at the theory of planned behavior overall and say there are three major antecedents to the th theory of planned behavior, social norms, attitudes and perceived behavioral control. So that antecedents would have a sub subheadings of those three things and then outcomes is generally um, a purchase intention. So purchase intention wouldn't have subheadings because there's only purchase intention to talk about. When you're looking at a paragraph, the paragraph what I'm expecting with housekeeping is that you don't have paragraphs of one or two sentences. Paragraphs need to have a topic sentence that says essentially this is what this paragraph is about. They then discuss that idea that they've introduced and then some sort of wrap up sentence. So your paragraph is not two lines, then the next paragraph, two lines, then the next paragraph. Now, these are these are rules that can sometimes be broken. But generally speaking, that's what you would expect. So paragraphs you would expect to have, be discussing an idea. Sentences are one element of that idea possibly two. So the shorter your sentences, the easier they are to understand. I always use a rule of thumb of about 20. If you have more than 25 words in a sentence, your sentence is probably too long. So you want to keep your sentences short because that's clearer, but also because you can arrange those ideas better because you're looking at the flow. And then the other thing to do is signposting. So when you're looking at signposting, and in this case, topic sentences, which I mentioned in relation to paragraphs. So signposting is about saying, this is where we've been, this is where we are now, and this is where we'll be next. So essentially, towards the end of each major section, you will be saying, well, this is what we've said so far and where we've gone. Now we'll be looking at A, B and C. Now, with topic sentences, what helps to understand whether your topic sentences are right, are working, is if you just read that first sentence of every paragraph throughout the dissertation, it should make sense. It should tell its own story. So these are kind of all housekeeping issues. They're about impression management, ensuring that when your reader or your marker looks at your document, the document makes sense to them. I'm hoping that makes sense to you as well. So next thing is what I would refer to as coherence and consistency. So when you're writing a dissertation or when, when your marker is reading a dis dissertation, they read the introduction, the literature, the methods, the results and the findings, the discussion and the conclusions. So you kind of read in that order. Except you don't always. Sometimes when I'm reading a dissertation, I look at the things that are supposed to connect with each other. So in your introduction, you will have said this is the problem statement. And I might go to the conclusion to say, well, have they said whether they've found out what they said they were going to find out? So I will look at the connection between your research questions that you've introduced in the introduction and whether you've told me the answer to those questions in the conclusion. So your chapter one is connected to your chapter six. Your chapter one is probably the last thing you will finalise when you're writing up which is counterintuitive in all sorts of ways. But that tends to be what happens in that you might draft things first, but it isn't until you know what you're concluding that you will make sure that your introduction fits to the things that have actually been found. So you need to be consistent between the question you're asking in chapter one and the conclusions you're drawing in chapter six. Second thing is that your discussion draws on and tells us how you have extended knowledge 
that you've introduced in the literature review. So when you're looking at the relationship between those two, your literature review has to say what we already know about something. Your discussion says how the research you have done extends or confirms or, re or just relates to what we already know. So those two things are very clearly linked to each other. Your methods chapter tells us how you've accessed knowledge, but if you, but because methods also dictate or confine what we can find out, they also impact on what you will be able to discuss and the conclusions you will be able to draw. And your results and findings, well, you can only get results that are related to the data you've collected, however you've collected that data. Now, quantitative projects tend to refer to results. Qualitative projects tend to re refer to findings. It's just a slight difference in convention. So your methods leads to what you can find out. The way you access information dictates the information that is actually in your results and findings. Now, obviously, that's related to your literature and everything else. So you're looking at the consistency between these different chapters, but you're also looking at things like, well, in your introduction, you will have said this is your question. Do the methods that have been used allow that question to be answered? So it's not just about saying the research question leads to the conclusions. It's also about saying, well, I if you say you want to do X, are the ways you're accessing information, the methods that you use, the research philosophy that you have, do they actually allow you to get at the information you need according to your research questions and or hypotheses? So I'll give you an example here of some marking a dissertation, which was a marginal dissertation. So it was a, if it was passing, it was passing at 50, at, at 50 so dead on the pass mark where at this particular institution I was at. And I failed it. And when I spoke, every dissertation there was marked by two people. And when the the other person who was marketing it said, marking it said to me, why did you fail it? I thought it was borderline. And I said, yes, but what was their objective? What was their stated objective in the dissertation? And they said, oh, they were going to compare these two countries. And I said, and at what point did they make any comparisons? And they said, well, they didn't. And I said, and that's why I failed it, because they didn't have to say they were making comparisons. Or they were going to compare these two countries, but that's what they said, and they never made any comparisons. Now, ideally, it was a quantitative study. They would have done statistical tests that made those comparisons, but I would have passed it if they'd have even discussed A versus B or had some conclusion related to it. But at no point in the whole dissertation was a comparison made, despite the fact that the objective said they were making comparisons. So that's what I mean by it's important to be consistent throughout your dissertation and coherence. So the coherence is about how it all fits together. Now, this might be in something as simple as how you define ideas, which we'll get through to in a second. So what I would refer to as those, these are the kind of the big picture, the coherence of the consistency uh, about the, the topic or the dissertation as a whole. Now, when you're looking at the next one, which is clarity and conciseness, this is more about when you're looking at the text that you use. Now, the first thing you need to know, and this is related to having a good problem statement, is do you know and are you able to communicate what you were trying to achieve? So 
have you clearly stated your research objective? Now, one of the things I would suggest that you do is, despite the fact that we want to avoid printing too much and all the rest of it, having your research objective on a piece of paper or something that you can glass, glance down at when you're doing all the other things is quite useful to keep you focused on what you should be talking about. Because that will allow you to avoid things later. So do you know what you're trying to achieve? Have you got a clear problem statement? Do you know why it is important? And do you know what it is, what your objectives are? These things, believe it or not, are often not present when you have a dissertation. The other thing is, have you defined your key concepts? So I'm going to use a key concept in marketing, which is satisfaction. There are e easily two or three different definitions that you can use for satisfaction. So just using two of them, you might define satisfaction as the positive disconfirmation of expectations. So if you define satisfaction as the positive disconfirmation of expectations, in order to be able to measure expectations, you would have to, sorry, measure satisfaction, you would first have to measure expectations and then you would have to measure performance because you can only see if performance exceeds expectations, which would be positive disconfirmation of expectations and as such satisfaction, if you've measured both what was expected and what occurred. So that would be about taking your, your definition of your key concept that would go into your measurement and the way you collected data, but also in terms of how you analyze data. Or you could define satisfaction as the effective response to a particular object in a particular point of time. So the literature uses both those definitions. Now, if you are saying satisfaction is your effective response to a particular object at a particular point in time, then you would need to be, when you're looking at measuring satisfaction, you would have to say, well, how do you feel about something which is effective? The object would need to be defined. So if you're looking at satisfaction with a restaurant, you need to define what you mean by a restaurant and probably break down the different elements of it at a particular point in time. So are you talking about whether you're satisfied with the restaurant just after you've finished your meal? Or are you talking about whether you're satisfied with the restaurant 24 hours later? When you look at things like a car, if you bought a new car, your satisfaction with a new car might change depending on how long between when you've got the car and when you're measuring satisfaction occurs. So the point here, is that if you're going to be clear, you need to define key concepts. So defining satisfaction in one way leads to certain types of decisions in terms of how you are collecting data, in how you are analysing data, in the things that are important when interpreting that data. So if you do not tell your reader which type of satisfaction in this example you're using, then you're not being clear. Being clear also helps you be a bit more concise because by being clear, you can say, according to this definition of satisfaction or the definition of satisfaction being used, these are the things we need to focus on. You, and it also means that when you're looking at your literature, you can say, these particular papers are more important because they use the definition of satisfaction we're interested in, whereas those are related but not necessarily central. So it helps you make those kinds of decisions as well. Right now, when we write up and when we are writing a dissertation, we make claims. So those claims are related to what we found out, to our results or our findings. Now, one of the things you need to be really clear about when you make a claim is what is the evidence for the claim you are making? So when you're writing up your conclusions or writing your discussion and writing your conclusions, 
you have to have a direct line to the results in order to support them. So your discussion will say, let's for um, a hypothetical example, your discussion might say, um, Smith and Jones talked about, oh, I'll use satisfaction again, because why not use the same example, satisfaction in relation to pet ownership, um, and found X, Y, and Z. In contrast, when looking at the ownership of specific types of pets, in this case fish, we found P, Q and Y. This extent, as such, it's important to consider the type of pet that is owned when trying to determine whether pet own ownership contributes to the well-being of individuals. So you, you, your argument makes a direct link between what was said in the literature, the claim you are making from your results, well, the claim you are making and the results that support that claim. The other thing you want to look at, and the other thing that helps your focus and ensure that you present material that is overall concise and clear, is if you can identify the arguments. So what is the argument, the thread of the argument? Essentially, A, and A says something, B says something, and as such, this is a problem. I'm going to go back to my weather example. So whilst authors A, B and C say that the weather differs according to where you are, and authors P, Q and X say that the weather is the same pretty much wherever you are, when looking at the methods used to collect data and where data was collected from, what we find is that, I oh, can't remember which way it was, uh, A, B and C collected data from relatively close geographic locations, whereas P, Q and X collected data from relatively distant geographic locations, which indicates that it might be that the weather varies according to distance from different locations, the distance between different locations. So now your argument is, well, A has said this, B has said this, what we want to test is whether it's distance between locations that impacts on the similarity of the weather. I mean, it's a bit of a silly example because it's fairly obvious, but hopefully that helps you understand what I mean by identifying your argument. You have, generally speaking with arguments, you have your thesis, your counter thesis, your thesis, your antithesis and your synthesis. So your thesis, the weather is the same wherever you are. Your antithesis, the weather differs according to where you are. Your synthesis is talking about how the uh, degree of proximity between two places impacts on the weather, whether the weather, whether the weather that would be not necessarily a good example, differs or is the same. Now, the other thing that having clear objectives and a clear problem statement helps you with, it helps you to identify irrelevant material. So when you first start exploring a problem, what you find is that you will read more and you will write more than you actually need because you haven't refined your arguments. But as you go through, when you're doing the final write-up, you want to say, is, is this necessary? Because if you have irrelevant material in there, it is distracting for the reader. It doesn't give a clear line of argument. It's also distracting for you in terms of identifying <laughs> what is required and what isn't. OK, so. What are common flaws in arguments? This is the argument for the whole thesis rather than for particular elements. So one thing is that you write a conclusion or you state a conclusion and you either don't have any evidence to support that conclusion. So your results that didn't actually explore that area or it's irrelevant to what you're looking at or you have inadequate evidence. So potentially medicine 
if you look at medicine and the history of medicine, most drugs were test have been tested on men or on males. So there's been conclusions drawn about how those drugs will affect females and children, which could either be said to be without evidence or could be concluded to be within adequate that it's inadequate evidence to support those conclusions. The other thing is that you might have evidence and you provide evidence but give no conclusion. So here it's about saying well you had a problem statement how and you've had objectives so when you're presenting this evidence how does that evidence relate to those objectives or help you understand or solve the problem. The other thing people will do quite commonly is they'll have evidence and a conclusion, but they're not actually linked to each other. So both the last two are about having evidence and having con conclusions, but they're not, that evidence does not lead to that conclusion or the conclusion is not clearly linked to the evidence. So that hopefully gives you a really whistle-stop tour, and I do realise it's a whistle-stop tour, of the problem statement and how it's important to really know what you're including and excluding within that. The literature review and how to think of the literature review. So with the literature review, it's really important to remember that you are telling us what is already known about something. And then what you might want to think about when you're writing up and when you're looking at those things this is what you're trying to achieve in your final document it won't necessarily be what you achieve in your first draft so i am more than happy to take any questions so what i'm going to do is i'm going to see if i can manage to stop the share yes so, any questions? Students, you may post your questions into the chat box. Or you can unmute and... Yeah, ask questions to Dr. Nina. Dr. Nina, regarding the structure that you shared with us just now on the chapters, yeah, in a um, mm -hmm. research report, yeah, um, what you presented just now, chapter five is a uh, discussion and chapter six is conclusion, right? Yeah, they might, they might mm -hmm. be combined. Yeah, yeah, that's um, the format given to our students. Actually, we combine chapter five uh, and six, uh, where chapter five includes uh, discussion and conclusion. Yeah. So when you look at that in terms of um, what you're thinking about, what you're saying is that your introduction, basically you, you top and tail your discussion, your thesis. So you top it with the introduction and you tail it the conclusion. There, then you go in a bit and that's the literature and the discussion. And then in the middle, you've got the methods which lead to the results or the findings. So if it's a se separate chapter or if it's a discussion and conclusions chapter, the principle still applies is your introduction leads to your conclusions and your literature leads to your discussion. Now, the discussion basically draws from the literature and your results or your findings. So, Hannah-Lisa, is that, Dr. Hannah-Lisa, is that how you would interpret it? Yeah. Yeah, um, agree with you actually, where we have to link the earlier chapters to chapter five and six. Yeah. Okay, okay. we have a question. So we've had here. A, yeah, evidence does not lead to the conclusion given. Okay, so um, if, for example, let's see with an example, I talk, I'm talking about the influence of well being with pets. And I've collected data from dog owners and cat owners. And then I say, uh, fish owners do not. So I've got no data from owners of fish. And I can have, um, I say, um, fish owners 
no, that's no evidence. Uh, dog and cat owners. Uh, Dog and cat owners have increases in well-being. Da, da, da. As such, we can conclude that all pet owners see increases in well-being. Now, the evidence was only looking at dog and cat owners, so I can't say that all pet owners have increases in well-being because I haven't got data from anything other than dog and cat owners. Does that make sense? I'm looking for a comment to say yay or nay from the particular person who asked the question. Um, agree, Good. meaning we can't we can't simply um, make general conclusion based on the evidence that we have. Yes, yeah. So you mm -hmm. you collected data from a concrete yeah. instance, which is cat and dog owners in this case. So if you're going to make conclusions about all pets, you might be able to say our evidence shows that owning a dog or a cat increases well-being. From this, we might extrapolate that pet owner, all pet ownerships lead, leads to increases in well-being. But what you're doing is you're saying, well, OK, we might extend this. We might we might conclude that all pet owners, but you're saying very clear that our evidence is drawn from dog and cat owners. So it's all about the wording matters. OK. OK, questions from other students? Oh, OK, there's another question there. Right, OK, including your own point of view, you're, you can draw conclusions from the literature based on your interpretation of the literature. So I'll go back to my weather example, which is a totally made up example. One literature said the weather differs according to where you are. The other literature says the weather is the same wherever you are. Now, my point of view is, however, unpacking that literature, what we find, what what these studies show or what studies of the weather show is that the proximity of two locations impacts on the extent to which the weather is similar or different. So. The literature is about what we already know, so your own point of view needs to be evidenced. It's not necessarily the easiest thing in the world to do. But Hannah Lisa, would you have anything to add to that? No, OK, you're on mute, so I yeah. don't know. <laughs> um, I, yeah, as you have said, I think that the, the problem with our, I mean, most of the students here, yeah, when they, they write the literature review, I mean, um, it's very difficult for them to to review all papers together. Yeah, but what they did, as you have said just now, um, they, they can discuss each paper very well. But in order to mm -hmm. synthesize, I mean, to analyze, to review those articles together, that can be quite challenging for them. There is a, um, let me see if I can find this. There's a book that I use. And this is aimed at postgraduate students. But it has some tools that might be useful. So it's called Critical Reading and Writing for Postgraduates. And one of the things it does is it says when you're looking at um, when you're looking at reading papers, you should be asking questions like why are the authors writing it? What do they claim? What evidence do they have for the claim? What conclusions do they draw? And it says for well, you to take those things and when you're writing it up, you say um, essentially you take all those things that the authors are looking at. So let's say the authors are looking at well-being. You list the claims about well-being and you list the evidence about well-being and you keep that attached to the 
the the different authors, but you're talking now about the idea of well-being. So you've taken it out of the individual context. So getting that skill is is useful. The other way you can do it is you can say, OK, well, let's look at we want to look at well-being. So what do I know about well-being from what I've read? And you're not looking at what you're, you you literally write a paragraph on what you know about well-being. And then you go back to the literature and find which parts support which which bits support which part the, the the different elements of the things that you've written so rather than try and write it from the literature you've read and immersed yourself in the literature you've made your notes and then you say well okay i'm going to talk about well-being what do i know and you write it down and then you say so you made statement one is supported by x statement two is supported by y whatever the different literatures so it's difficult. It is really difficult to move away from the focus on individual papers to the focus on ideas. But the literature review, a really good literature review, focuses on ideas. Yeah, got that. I think that that's what most students um, are doing. Actually, when um, they they wrote themselves, I mean, whatever that, that they have thoughts on that particular topic mm. and then find literature to support those ideas. Yeah, that, I mean, it's mm. it's it's difficult to move away from individual yeah. things, but yeah. it's a bit like. It's right. If you look at what you're trying to do is you're trying to. You're trying to build a complete picture of something. So let's go back to the jigsaw. When you look at a completed jigsaw, you talk about the sky or the house in it or the rest of it. But if you look at an individual piece, an individual piece might have a bit of roof and some sky. But you need to talk about the sky with the sky and the bit of roof with the bit of roof. So that paper might contribute to two different areas. But you, so your papers are individual pieces of a jigsaw. And if you look at a jigsaw and you're describing a jigsaw, you don't describe it individual pieces, you describe the overall picture. And that's what you're trying to achieve with the literature review. Yep. Okay. I hope um, Dr. Nina has answered your question. 0126112. I can get a name here, but I can see your ID. I hope Dr. Nina answered the question. Oh, yeah. good. <laughs> okay, good to hear that. All right, um, Dr. Nina, can you in, explain further on a research gap? I mean, from the literature review, how they can establish research gap? Okay, I don't like the term research gap, and I don't like the re term research gap because a gap implies that you have something on either side of it. Mm -mm. So sometimes, I, so I tend to use research opportunity um, because that might be that there's an opportunity because there's a gap between two things, but the opportunity might be to go beyond something that already exists. So, for example, you might have done or someone might have done research. Let's go back to dogs and cats and well-being. Um, you might have done research, someone People might have done lots of research on the impact of uh, dogs, dogs on the well-being of pet owners. Now, it's not really a gap to something else to say, well, let's do research on cats and see if the same effect occurs, or let's do research on goldfish and see if the same effect occurs. So I would say that's a research opportunity because you have an idea that a different context will have, will increase your understanding of something. Now, when you're looking at that, when you're saying a different context will increase your understanding of something, then you have to have a reason, a, a theoretical reason for justifying that difference. So let's use dogs and cats and pet ownership as an example. When you look at dogs and cats as a pet owner, you interact with them. So you stroke cats, you, 
you take dogs for walks, you play with them. And now you might say, well, OK, I'm really interested to know with a pet that you don't really have much interaction with, whether you still see the benefits of pet ownership in terms of well-being. Now, to do that, I'm going to look at fish. Not a lot of interaction goes on with fish. So there you've said, I have a theoretical reason for believing that the ownership of fish might differ in terms of well-being for pet owners than the ownership of dogs and cats. So I've not just said, I want to look at the, this study has been done in the US and I want to do it in Malaysia, full stop. You said, this study has been done in the US. The US is an individualistic culture. Malaysia is a more collectivist culture. Because of this study, the concept that they're looking at could differ according to the motives of the people involved, then studying this thing in a more collectivist culture than the US may provide more insights into the behaviours that we're concerned about. So it's a research opportunity. Now, a research gap might exist in that if I'm just going to use Hofstede's, um, Hofstede's cultural ideas. You might say, well, we've studied this in the highly individualistic culture. It's been studied in a highly collectivistic culture. What about the cultures in between, which are about mid-level? So that would be a gap between the knowledge taken from the individualistic cultures and the knowledge taken from the collectivist cultures. So, yeah, research opportunity, because it allows you to extend rather than research gap. Does that answer your question, Dr. Hannah-Lisa? Yeah, um, yes, yes, at least because they are more familiar with research gap, but I think using research opportunity to show that that's the opportunity that we can explore further, right? Yeah, mm -mm. yeah. No, I mean, most people use research gap is tends to be what you see in the when it's written about. And I, I just think it doesn't adequately capture the fact that not everything is. So, OK, any other, other questions? questions? Yeah, from students. You have other questions? Especially on problem statement, literature review. Oh, no, there don't seem to be too many. Mm -hmm. All right. I don't know whether that's yeah. was at the wrong level or whether it's just all very clear. <laughs> it's knows? very clear, this, especially using your your examples. Yeah, uh, cats and dogs, uh, fish, yeah. and I think well, it's easier for them to understand. I, it's easier for me to understand as well. Yeah, so <laughs> agree. Yeah. Um, the, the in organizing the literature, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Do you recommend any any tool? I mean, here they are exposed to to metrics in organizing those literature. And what is your advice? Um, what would I look? Okay, there are rules of thumb about things like how long should an introduction be, how long should your conclusions be. Um, and how long your literature should be, but they they're very kind of broad based. So I would I would say when you're writing up your thesis, you're probably talking about ten percent of the word count is going to be the introduction, uh, ten percent the conclusion bit of your discussion and conclusion, and you're probably depending on the type of dissertation you're doing because if you're using qualitative methods, it might differ from quantitative methods probably say about 25% is going to be your literature. Now, when you're organising your literature, go from general to specific. So always kind of start off with the bigger picture, but not so big that you're totally missing the target. So when you're doing your literature, often you'll be looking at the relationship between two or more concepts. So ideally, you would like to find things that actually intersect, so cover both concepts. But you may well have to go to literature that is 
less closely related to what you're interested in, but it's about finding a balance. It's about you don't want to present just one side of an argument. That's not an academic piece of work. It's about finding the balance between enough and not too much. So I had a PhD student who never seemed to get to the end of her literature review. And we discovered that, so we were talking about why not? And she said, well, I've got these 19 other PhD theses to read. And it's like, no, you don't. That's too much. The problem we have now is we can get so much information that we can get overloaded with that information. So you need to pick out recent work. You need to pick out work that is within the context that you're interested in. And you need to pick out work that is seminal, so highly cited early work. But there's a lot of work that you can essentially ignore because you don't have the time. You're not doing PhDs at this point. And even if you were, you still have to be a bit selective, but you have more time to work out how. So you have to be presenting enough literature that you show that you've accessed a good variety of literature, that you've accessed more than one side of an argument or more than one perspective on the thing that you're looking at. And the problem is, is that there's no hard and fast rule. Structuring it is about making it easy for the reader. So tell you a personal story. When I first had, so when I'd finished um, my master's and I went back to do my, do my PhD it was a few years later and I was in the room where my undergraduate exam papers were stored and as anyone would I dug out my marketing research paper and my strategic marketing paper and on one of them I'd got a distinction and on the other I'd got a high distinction and when you looked at the difference between the two papers, the difference between the distinction mark and the high distinction mark was almost all in the structure. So one was really well organized and flowed well, and the other one was a bit all over the place. So structure can make a huge difference and structure is about making it easy for your reader to follow your argument. I don't know that I can answer it in any other way, Dr. Hanna-Lisa. So yeah. if you can add, that would be fabulous. <laughs> you have answered all those questions. Um, um, any other questions from students? You can unmute if you want. Mm? No. Nope. Oh, no. All right, um, if there's no question from the students, I think we can end the session, Dr. Nina. Okay, no problem. Thank you for listening. Okay, thank you, Dr. Nina, for um, okay. sharing. Yeah, very clear and straightforward uh, presentation. I hope uh, students benefit from this session, especially those students who um, will start their yeah, final year project next semester. And we have also those students who have started actually. Yeah, and um, they are going to collect their data. So at least they have clear understanding on especially problem statement, literature review that we have discussed. Yeah, with that, um, we end the session. Dr. Now, Nina. Now the, the, the slide on the problem statement. Mm -mm. Sorry, the, the slide on the problem statement does have a little video you can link to. So, um, more than happy for that to be shared. Yeah, I can share the material. It's not with mine. Students. It's what I found on YouTube. <laughs> okay. All right. I will share it with the students. Yeah. So before we end the session, maybe students, um, if you can on your camera so that for photo session, for me to submit um to the school for recording. Students. Okay. A few others. Give me a few seconds. All right. Okay, thank you so much, um, Dr. Nina. Hope to see you, thank again you in future research workshops. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Dr. Nina. Thank you, students. Bye bye. Okay. Take care. Day. Bye. Bye.